Welcome to Career Explorations, a series of panel discussions featuring faculty and alumni from, from Drexel University's Thomas R. Klein School of Law here in Philadelphia. I'm Donna Gerson, Associate Dean in charge of the Career Strategies Office. Tonight's program is all about civil litigation careers. When you think about a lawyer, the most common image that comes to mind is typically the lawyer in the courtroom arguing before a jury. But is that the whole story? And what does civil litigation entail? Are you always in the courtroom? And if you're not in the courtroom, what type of work are you doing? And by the way, what is ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution? Tonight, we're going to find out. Learn about the wide range of practice possibilities that involve civil litigation and alternative dispute resolution. Hear about the law school's latest academic concentration. See how our alumni are shaping their careers in civil litigation. Discover the co-curricular offerings at Drexel University that will help you develop your professional skills and build your network. Now, I wanna introduce you to Jessica Starring, a third year law student who is president of the Moot Court Board. Jess is enrolled in our IP concentration among, and among other roles that she serves in, she is a law school admissions ambassador. Jess is a graduate of Westchester University with a degree in forensic and toxicological chemistry and enrolled in law school after several years working as a chemist. She will be joining the New York City law firm Paul Hastings following graduation. Jess, welcome. Thank you, Dean Gerson. Um, so as Dean Gerson mentioned, my name is Jess. I'm a 3L and the president of the Moot Court Board here at the Klein School of Law. And I'm just going to preview the three co-curriculars that we have available related to the civil litigation concentration. So the first, as uh, Dean Gerson mentioned, ADR is the Alternative Dispute Resolution. And students on this team compete in competitions directed towards the areas of civil litigation that are outside of the trial and appellate courtrooms. The competitions focus on four different areas, client counseling, negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. Next up, we have the trial advocacy team. So this team similarly competes in competitions across the nation, but the focus is on the trial portion of litigation. The program trains students in the practical skills of litigation in the courtroom setting. And our team's performance was ranked number three in the Fordham School of Law's trial competition rankings. Lastly, um, we have the Moot Court Board, which as I mentioned, I am the president of. Um, the team competes in competitions that are focused on the appellate level of civil litigation. And in addition to the performative oral argument component of a moot court competition, there is an additional written component that becomes incorporated into the competition score. So moot court competitions have this performative element to them as well as a written element. All three of these co-curriculars help expose students to the practical elements of civil, civil litigation uh, practice. And if anyone listening has any more specific questions about these three co-curriculars, I'll be posting my email address in the chat and you can feel free to reach out to me at any time. And next up, I'd like to introduce Professor Richard, Richard Frankel. Um, Richard Frankel is the director of the new Civil Litigation and Dispute Resolution Concentration. Since 2009, he has directed the law school's Federal Litigation and Appeals Clinic in which law students represent indigent clients in a variety of litigation matters. Prior to joining the Thomas R. Klein School of Law, he was the Goldberg Dietzler Fellow for Trial Lawyers for Public Justice in Washington, D.C., where he litigated class action, consumer protection, and civil rights cases. Very briefly, um, the concentration has a few requirements which you can find um, on our website, but there's, uh, you have to take uh, four required courses related to trial advocacy and, and evidence, um, uh, a couple of elective courses, and then uh, a capstone in which you do a, an experiential, uh, you get an experiential opportunity either in the clinic or a co-op or some other similar type of program. 
Um, and now I would like to introduce our panelists for today's discussion, all of whom are graduates of the Drexel University Klein School of Law. Um, Shelly, would you like to start? So I am Shelly Pasnogas. I went to undergrad at Temple University. I was a dual major in something called visual communication anthropology, which is basically just anthropology, and uh, Spanish. And then um, obviously went to law school. I graduated 2017. I currently work at Klein Inspector. I am an associate for Andy Stern and Liz Crawford. We generally do the bulk of, you know, catastrophic injury cases. Um, but I would say the, most of what I do is medical malpractice. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sam Paul. I graduated from Drexel or Klein School of Law in 2018. Uh, before that, I was, uh, well, long before that, I was at uh, Temple University where I graduated um, with a degree in theater and communications. Uh, took some time off in between undergrad and law school, a nice uh, seven years to let things sink in after undergrad, um, and uh, then realized it was time to go back to school, so I ended up back at Drexel. And um, now I work as a litigation associate at Stradley Ronan, Stevens and Young. Um, I'm in the, uh, mainly I work with the partners in the insurance practice group doing a lot of uh, insurance coverage work. Right now we are um, defending many business interruption claims that you've probably heard about in the news um, due to COVID-19 um, and also do some securities um, litigation uh, FINRA arbitrations and internal investigations at large uh, investment firms. Hi, uh, my name is Peter McCall. I am actually from St. Louis, Missouri. So I went to undergraduate out there at Truman State University. Um, I took one year off uh, and then came to Drexel and I, I graduated in what? I think it was 2013. It's getting hard to remember at this point, um, which is a good thing for the school. Um, I am now an associate in the uh, litigation associate primarily uh, in the Pittsburgh office of Jones Day. Uh, my specialty is really construction, so sort of large energy projects, um, uh, big buildings, uh, small buildings are, are unfortunately not something I get to do a lot, um, but sort of complex engineering problems are what our people retain us to handle, and I do about 70%, 80% litigation, and then about 20% transactional work because construction is sort of a, a microcosm that there's not a lot of specialties in. Great. Thanks, everybody. And um, tell us a little bit about what a typical day in your work life is, is like. Um, Peter, would you like to start this time? Sure. So, um, yeah, so I mean, I do the types of cases that I work on are in office cases. I, I don't go to court very often. I, I probably go to court a couple times a year uh, on motions, et cetera. And then we may have bigger hearings also once or twice a year. Um, now all those are online, but um, most of my daily activities are sort of um, a combination of legal research, sort of strategizing, um, uh, writing correspondence to opposing counsel, et cetera but it is largely sort of in office work on with usually between two and three or four other people because um, they're large litigation teams. Uh, uh, Shelly or Sam? Sure. Um, so I was actually thinking about how to answer this question earlier today, and I think the answer is that you can't sometimes, um, which is, I think, one of the coolest parts about my position is that every day is kind of a new challenge. You kind of have to roll with the punches. You might have a week of, you know, diving through medical records and trying to draft a complaint, and then the next week you're writing a 40-page brief that has to get filed by that Friday. Then the week after that, you're driving up to North Jersey in the middle of PA for depositions or whatever. And then the following week, you could finally get back to those complaints you were working on. Um, so it is a lot of, you know, a lot of prep preparation. Um, obviously, on TV, like it, litigators are often just storming the courtroom every day. And that, that happens when you're in trial. But there is a lot of writing and researching, which I enjoy. Um, and there's a lot of client interaction, which is also, um, I think, something that people are drawn to in litigation. Usually you're people people, 
that makes sense. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a little bit of everything. So typical work day, you know, you just wake up and you, you go where the day takes you, I guess. <laughs> So my experience is uh, very similar to Shelley's, except on the opposite side. I'm drafting the answer to the complaint and drafting the opposition to the motions. Um, and it, but, but it is very different day to day. It is it is tough to tell what uh, what any one day uh, will will hold, um, and that's you know, what things looked like, obviously, six months ago, and what they look like now are, are a little bit um, different. But yeah, I, I'm doing uh, a lot of a lot of drafting, drafting um, motions, opposition to motions, correspondence uh, with the court, opposing counsel, um, doing a lot of strategy and legal research, you know, digging deeper than I would ever imagine into Westlaw to look for things that I didn't know existed maybe that morning. Um, but uh, after a conversation with with a partner, it turns out you know I'm going to become an expert on this very discreet area of law. Um, and also, I one thing I, I forgot to mention that has, because it's now just starting back up. There was a large break. Is I do um, fair hearings um, for we represent a, a Medicaid. Um, an MCO that administers Medicaid and we represent them when beneficiaries challenge a reduction in their benefits. So um, they're entitled to a hearing before an administrative law judge. And um, a lot of what I was uh, doing before the everything started with COVID was driving to New Jersey seems to be a popular place. Um, all sorts of different places over all throughout Jersey doing these these fair hearings. Um, now they are, I just had one over the phone, the first telephonic hearing, which was very interesting. I'd love to have some clarification from the panelists about um, the, the types of clients that you have, because I don't know if our listeners understand, for example, that Shelley, you're representing medical malpractice um, people who are plaintiffs versus Sam and Peter, who are generally representing defendants. Can you talk a little bit about like the defense versus plaintiffs and sort of the philosophy behind that and whether people have to choose, why you would choose, et cetera? Sure. Um, well, from my perspective, and you know, I guess we will probably get into this more over the course of the next 30 or so minutes. Um, I actually never planned on being in civil litigation or really litigation at all. Um, my first internship was with Highest Philadelphia, which is an excellent immigration nonprofit, and I represented SIJ cases, which was um, basically children of abused, neglected, and abandoned um, that are undocumented, yeah, so they're undocumented, and they're also um, unaccompanied in the U.S., and what I took from that, and I, I love, I absolutely love that internship. I had, if you if you're at all interested in nonprofit work, I highly recommend looking into Highest for an internship your first summer, because You'll, you'll get thrown in the deep end and you will learn a lot um, and really come out feeling fulfilled. But I kind of took from that that I, I really just like working with the clients a lot. Um, I really like that part of being an advocate. And, and then I thought I was going to be a startup business attorney. I was actually in the business concentration in law school and I did the entrepreneurship clinic. And I took the same thing from that. I really liked working on one with these small business owners and like figuring out what they needed and how to resolve their issues. Um, very, very critical thinking, problem solving. Um, a lot of things that I just, I enjoy, I like to be challenged by. So the, the, while it doesn't sound like the transition into plaintiff's med mal really makes sense, it was kind of organic. Although, you know, the way I got this job is interesting, and we can talk about it later if you want, but I find that the theme of my experience has been I really like dealing with people one-on-one -on -one and trying to find a way to make them whole or, you know, try to not, not necessarily fix what happened because there's a lot of cases where you just can't do that, but really finding, I don't use the term justice, that's a little bit, you know, cheesy, but that's kind of what it is at the end of the day. At least that's how we feel, and, um, you know, and that's just, that's kind of how I ended up where I am. Thank you. Sam, Peter, anyone want to chime in? Sure. So, so I had sort of a similar plurality of things going on when I was in law school. I did some criminal defense uh, internships and then I did a uh, judicial internship. But um, in terms of plaintiffs for defense, 
uh, I had the luxury of not having to choose um, because in construction, there's, you know, the, it, it's your client. Your client may need to sue someone one day and you may otherwise be defending a claim the other. Um, and, and, and certain sort of areas are like that. I mean, I know there's, I did insurance defense when I started and I, I've been there. Insurance defense attorneys do not talk to plaintiff's attorneys except in the courtroom. Um, that's not fair, but um, you know, they are entirely separate camps and, and, and there are ideological differences there. Um, but if you are not, you know, ideologically one or the other, um, there's certainly plenty of room for you in litigation. It's just, um, you know, not going to be on the insurance side. Usually you're going to have to sort of find, like I did, sort of an area where uh, your skills are necessary, regardless of, you know, what, whether it's insurance coverage or otherwise. Um, and then you go from there. Um, and that's, I, th I think that covers it, I guess. No, thank you. And Sam? So I should confess that this is not, um, certainly not something I put uh, a lot of thought into when deciding on a, on a career path. Um, I ended up at where I am because the people I met during the, the job search, um, I really like the, the people at Stradley are, are great people. Um, and really I could be representing plaintiffs, defendants, or, or doing, you know, any number of things. Um, but I think what's, what's really important for me is, is the, the team that I'm working with. Um, and so I, I just kind of fell into, to where I am. Um, and, and it's worked out well I, and I, and I enjoy it. But I think one of the interesting things that I've learned over the last two years is, uh, or one of the things I had no idea when I started about was what, what, what is a client in a circumstance like this? When you have a big organization or a, a huge investment management firm and they're doing an internal investigation, what does it mean to talk to the client? Like, who am I talking to? Um, generally, I'm not talking to anybody who's the client. Um, it's usually going through the, the partner. Um, they don't trust me that much just yet. But, you know, a lot of times I'm drafting the draft, the email to the client, and then it will get reviewed. Partner will put his or her name on it, and then it will go out, um, go out to the client. But um, when dealing with clients in the work that I do, we're generally dealing with one point person with three or four other people um, in uh, at the um, the business or firm that we're representing, and it's um, really you know we're, we're we're talking to a lot of a lot of different people um, at once. So if we have to get something uh, cleared by the client, we're communicating something to maybe four different people, and they're having an internal conversation among them, and then we're getting on a phone call where there's you know it can be seven or eight people on the phone at once, all coming to a um, a a uh, joint decision or, or generally finding more work to put on my plate to figure out uh, and then we'll reach the the decision um so th that's that's been interesting it's not really um you know one one person i just didn't know how that worked when they're like this is the client i'm like well who is this person that we're talking to at this at this big organization and you know it's the general counsel or the associate general counsel i you know i didn't know what those things meant so i i found that to be um really interesting and a lot of times um, you know the, the the people who we're dealing with at these large institutional clients are super smart lawyers that know a lot about their particular business and it, it can you know it can really keep you on your toes um, as opposed to when, I, when I've done some pro bono work and I'm um, working with uh, a person who has no experience at all with with the law it's a much uh different experience talking to those two different types of clients um so eventually i'll hopefully get good at it one day and then i'll probably be ready to retire <laughs> well it's good to hear that you've all had such interesting journeys um, into these different types of jobs and one of the things that i'll flag for our our listeners is that it seems like you all had number one open minds about this and two you had a, a range of experiences that helped inform your decision making process as you went through law school at drexel 
So I wanted to ask you a little bit to give some thought to, were there particular courses, um, including you know, any courses that were particularly um, important to you in your professional development, or um, were there any particular work experiences during either the summers or pro bono that were important to you in your development? Shelly, you mentioned highest, but um, Peter, do you want to start us off with some thoughts about that? Sure. So um, I thought about this because you you, you uh, prepped us for it. And I, and I think that uh, if I had to recommend a course or two that everyone take, uh, because it will touch on your practice at some point, no matter what you do. Um, business organizations is probably first and foremost, um, just because that is whether you do, you know, largely public interest work in a, in a small setting versus work at a mega firm, that will come up, period. With transactional or litigation, at some point you will have to deal with that. Um, the other thing that I, as a litigator, really enjoyed uh, and thought was really, was a good jumpstart um, program was the trial advocacy program. I took, you know, intro to trial ad, et cetera drafting briefs, doing oral arguments, et cetera, uh, because especially early in my career, I was working at a couple of mid-sized firms and I already, had, you know, law school traditionally doesn't prepare you to practice law particularly well. And at Drexel with those classes, I already had an idea what a motion should generally look like, right? I already had an idea about going up and doing oral arguments. I'd practiced them a number of times. And depending on where you go from Drexel, there's a pretty good chance that within three months, you may end up doing exactly that. And it would be really great if you understood from day one, you know, the basics of how all that's going to flow. Um, I think that gives you a big leg up on some, on other graduates coming out who have done some internships and things, but don't get sort of that on your feet experience before they leave. Thank you. Shelley? Yeah, um, so I guess the most obvious answer was my clerkship with client inspector in my serial year. Um, that definitely prepared me for my current position at client inspector, very much so. Um, so don't be afraid to, you know, if you can manage it, it's, it's, it's hard, it's all about a balancing act really. Um, working your third year is difficult, but if, if you are given an opportunity to like clerk somewhere or, or co-op somewhere um, that you think you might be interested in working at someday, by all means do it because you, you don't get to know a position better than actually being in the position. And one of the great things about this law school is that the focus is very much on experiential learning. So those opportunities are going to come around if you keep your eyes and ears open. Um, I mean, specifically with regard to classes, I agree biz org 100%, super helpful. Um, also like there's, there's a lot of like, uh, like there's a pretrial advocacy course that's very simulation oriented. So you actually do the discovery, you draft the discovery, discovery, you draft the responses, you do a pretend deposition, anything where you actually get, you know, your, your hands dirty with the actual work you might be doing someday is helpful. Um, any, any statute or case-based course, I know that sounds very obvious, but pretty much any position you're going to get you're gonna be analyzing statutes and cases off the bat. They're gonna probably have you be writing unless you're purely a transactional attorney. And then you'll be doing contracts, obviously. Um, so like I, I took asylum and refugee law, very statute heavy course. Even though I don't use those statutes every day, I actually took a lot of that skill. I learned about analyzing statutes um, with Judge Morley and applied it to my everyday practice. And law review, I'm sure Sam will agree with me. We, we might be a little biased. Law review, 100%. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> so I, I can't even begin to describe that if you have law review on your resume, it opens so, so many doors, especially if you get an executive position, even if you don't, um, and even if you don't get on your first year, it's not the end of the world, try again. Um, everyone loves a law review person because they know you're good at writing and that's what they want in their, in their team. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for that. You usually, I think you, you, I say audition, audition at the end of your 1L year. Um, yeah, so you have time. Don't worry about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> and Sam. Yeah, in the audition, you have to memorize a couple bars of uh, music, and it's not it's not too bad. Um, <laughs> you can choose. That. So um, I'm kidding, of course. So I will add. I think the most um, there. Well, there was a lot of great classes uh, that I took, but I think from <laughs> courses that I could 
choose admin law was administrative law is hugely important, um, at least for the work I do. Um, like I said, I do these New Jersey fair hearings. That's all, um, it's all regulations that are promulgated by a state agency. It, the trials are held or the hearings are held before an administrative law judge. Um, we do a lot of healthcare um, litigation and you know, all, all that is admin law stuff. Admin law touches everything you do, uh, just like biz orgs, and I, and I second the, the, the biz orgs. Um, so the other thing that I really benefited from, and this is not just because Professor Frankl is here, I would say this anyway. Uh, you can't hear me? I can hear you. Oh, oh you can you're hear back. Me? He's back. <laughs> All right. So um, is the um, Civil Litigation and Appeals Clinic, uh, I don't know if it's called something different now, um, but during that experience, uh, I was able to, um, so we represented a um, woman who was seeking asylum here in the US and you know, we got to investigate the case, draft affidavits, um, and you know, prepare for the whole hearing. I got to do a direct examination. Um, and uh, at the hearing in front of a, a federal um, administrative law judge, which was very exciting. Uh, and th that experience was really great because it showed me that, you know, even though it was far from a perfect execution, um, that we could, as a team, I could be a member of a team that could do, that could go forward and accomplish this full process from start to finish. Um, and we were successful, which was nice also, but even if we weren't, it still would have been a, a great experience. So that, that was very real world experience. And that was being, um, thrown into the deep end with, uh, a couple lifeguards, you know, right around the pool, Professor Frankel being, being one of them. Um, and yeah, law review, do it. Even if you don't know what it is right now, just mark it down as one thing you're going to do. Um, it will, uh, make you a better writer. So I look back on sort of what I've kind of things I've done in my career and tried to correlate them to what courses I took in law school. And it's like, it's terrible. Um, the things I took in law school because of what I thought I was going to practice, I don't end up using. All the classes I chose not to take because I thought I wasn't interested in them do actually relate to the kinds of practice that I now do. And I just mean it to say, um, I agree with what people say about courses, but don't, if you feel like, oh no, I didn't take that course in law school or my schedule looks like this, relax, it'll be okay. You'll figure it all out. And it's, it, you know, there's no, there's no course that's an end all, it's an end all, um, be all. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you, you all mentioned, um, there are courses you took in law school, um, summer jobs. Uh, Shelly, you're talking about your clerkship experience uh, at Client Inspector and, clinic, and clinical and experiential opportunities. Um, I'd be also be interested to hear about your sort of post-graduation um, experiences. Peter, I know you did a, a judicial clerkship um, with the New Jersey Superior Court after graduation. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like and how it helped in your subsequent job search following the clerkship? Yeah, yeah. So I I cannot recommend a clerkship enough um, for two reasons. One, uh, coming out of a judge's chambers, you're far more eligible for employment. But two, spending a year in a judge's chambers or two, depending on the type of clerkship it is, um, enables you to get an insight into the way that courts operate that most attorneys do not have and that I still reap the benefits of seven, six and change years later um, in handling sort of administrative issues with cases that I'm running. Um, so I clerked at the Superior Court in New Jersey, which is the trial level uh, in the civil division for a year in Atlantic City. Um, it, it, was a little bit, it was a little bit of a, a deep end throwing situation because um, I happened to clerk for the busiest judge in that vicinage. And so I ended up with essentially sort of primarily responsible for, for reviewing and uh, drafting uh, memorandums of decision on between 60 and like 140, I think was the highest number of motions that we had uh, on a two week turnaround period. Um, and so that will, get, will teach you all about sort of civil litigation very quickly. 
um, at least in terms of the sort of the public facing discovery issues, summary judgment, et cetera. Um, it was a great writing experience. It was a good working experience because the bottom line is they call, litigants call the judges chambers, the, uh, the clerk picks up. I mean, you, it's very much hands-on experience from day one. Uh, and so I cannot recommend that enough if not, for no other reason than um, sort of understanding how to work with the court staff and the judge, et cetera. Um, but two, in terms of job search, it was very, it was useful for me. Uh, I came back um, to practice out of Spectre Gad and Rosen for a year and change. Um, that certainly sort of helped them assuage their fears that I as a first year was not gonna be quite a first year. Um, so I would absolutely recommend that. It, it, try it, no matter what you do, try it. Make the application, worst case scenario, you don't get it, that's fine. Um, but you definitely, you know, raise your hand for that, just like you do with uh, law review. And uh, I will plug law review, even though I was not on it and detested the idea and did not do it. I will tell you that a few years later uh, into practice, I absolutely recognized that law review would have enabled me to get some more opportunities because if it was on my resume, people would have looked a little bit differently at what it was. So absolutely do your best to do both write on competitions, one L and two L year. That's all we could ever hope for. Um, and um, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, and you've all talked about sort of uh, types of work that you do um, in your various offices. Um, but I'll, I'd also be interested to hear about the, the skills uh, that you think come into play uh, most often or the ones that are most important to your success in your areas of practice. Whoever wants to start us off. I'll jump in. Um, good legal writing skills and also good writing skills more generally. So there is writing that I do for motions and the, the, the good legal writing, um, you know, which I, I think back to Professor Montemorano, the things that she taught me being able to draw a line right here in the paper, and this is all law, and this is all application, like sticking to that form, and then finding some freedom in that form as you know, as you advance a little bit. Um, that is important. And um, if you're good at it, it will make you stand out. Uh, partners will be glad that they don't have to revise your work uh, a thousand times. And my work still gets heavily revised and I will for a, a long time until someone, until I'm doing the revising. Um, but it is, it is really important. And then the, the other part of that, the writing that's important is, is also just writing emails because that's, you know, a lot of the communication to clients and, and partners and everything, especially now, is um, writing out emails and, um, you know, being able, that's a little bit different than, you know, legal writing. Um, you still need to incorporate a lot of those skills, but it needs to be framed a little bit differently and um, making sure you are explaining certain risks that are involved but not overstating them and being kind of really delicate with with the words you're you're using so uh you know to the extent you are writing emails to your professors or, or other people you're interacting with um use it as an opportunity to practice that those skills of, of writing clear but succinct emails um you know don't start don't start it with hey so and so um, you know, and drop in an LOL or anything like that. Use it as an opportunity to, to practice um, that skill. Um, and I think that that's, that's most important. So I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, um, to piggyback off of Sam, um, communication is key, I think in really any situation, but um, definitely if you're a litigator um, and, not, and definitely with the actual technical writing and researching skill, you're always gonna need to be able to explain concepts or complex legal concepts um, in a way that your client will understand, your, a judge will understand, a partner, if, you're, if you can't quite figure out what you're trying to say, you need to be able to explain your position. Um, but also communication just kind of more of as like a personal social concept in that you should be aware of 
how you work best. So as, as a personal anecdote, like I, when I first started working for Liz Crawford and Andy Stern, I flat out told them, I was like, I'm a very deadline oriented person. Even if something's not due on a day, I like to have a day and I will get it done by that day. And that's the way our relationship has been ever since, you know, Shelly, can you do this? Can I get it back to you by Friday? Or, you know, no, I need it sooner. Or no, they could take more time with it. Or yeah, Friday is great. We, we created a relationship where I communicated, you know, how I operate and they communicate with me how they operate. And we've met in the middle and really found a way to be productive and efficient. So communication, both with technical skills, but also with like actual personal relationships with the people you work with is super helpful. Anything you, you add? Yeah, I think you know, aside from writing and just being generally brilliant, that's always helpful. Um, I think the willingness to work uh, is critical. I got where I am today because I was willing to work day in, day out. Uh, and I'm not trying to scare anyone to think you have to work 24 hours a day. But, you know, law is a longitudinal sort of in pursuit. Your cases, unless you were a very specialized area, are rarely over within a week or two or three or five. Or, you know, you're looking at months and months, if not years, of having to come back to the same issue, rehash them, and sort of uh, work with somebody on that, whether it be a deposition, whether it be a negotiation, a uh, trial. You're always going to be dealing with um, sort of juggling a, a number of balls over a long period of time. And um, I firmly believe that the, one of the biggest things that has enabled me to get where I am is um, a combination of some organization, because that's, that's going to be critical, especially when you get a few years in and, and people start trusting you to just do things on your own. Uh, you have to keep track of what's going on. But two, um, just a, a willingness and, 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 and sort of a, you need to excel at um, sort of uh, working Till the work is done. Um, and that doesn't mean working every night, but that does mean, you know, managing yourself and the expectations you have in terms of deadlines, uh, like Michelle said, and getting all of it done um, in plenty of time, hopefully, uh, for whatever, whatever uh, deadlines are coming up. And that's, that's, I think, an area where a lot of people trip, um, especially after a year or so. Um, you know, I see it as a mid to senior associate. I see junior associates working for me that are, you know, have issues sort of managing their workload and managing the expectations. And that is um, an area that if you're ready for it, you're fine. But, you know, if you don't sort of keep track of this and, and, and know that that's coming, um, that is a way that a lot of people can, you know, it's not going to end your career no matter what. But, but that is a way you can set your way yourself apart um, by really sort of excelling at the sort of the, the management of your practice yourself, because no one else is going to help you uh, unless at least you ask. Um, and you, know, you have mentors and hopefully you will ask, but that's something to keep in mind as you go forward it, the moment you leave law school. So Peter, can I jump in with a follow up on that? Because sure. this is, you know, I, I'm, I'm maybe getting to that point or will be to that point shortly where, um, you know, things are start, I'm, I'm becoming less um, task based, um, like on a production side. So I want to say thank you to our panelists. This was just wonderful. Uh, thank you, Professor Frankel, uh, and to Jessica Starring for speaking about moot court and other co-curriculars. Thank you again from Drexel University's Thomas R. Klein School of Law. Have a good night. Take care. Mm -hmm.